couldn't do what I wanted to do. Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 21 tonight. Continuing. Quickly approaching uh, 250 lessons from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 8 says the way of a man is froward and strange but as for the pure his work is right <clears throat> as we think about this verse tonight I want to ask the question which way and I had this idea to you know have this sign here which way would you choose the way of life or the way of death I realized after I came up with this idea that the correct answer is it depends who put the sign there there's multiple signs put by different people promising the same thing there's the sign of man and the end thereof is death, but it seems right to man to go that way. It seems like it's the right thing to do. People are, are very sincere in being wrong about that. They say this is the way of life, but in reality, it's the way of death. The other option presented to us in the verse is if the Lord puts the sign there. And the Lord does put the sign there. He says, follow me. And you'll find life. In fact, follow me and he who loses his life for my sake, Jesus says, gains it. We haven't really lost anything. To reject Jesus is to choose the way of death. Man says, follow me and I'll give you life. But he cannot deliver on his promise. The verse makes this distinction for us. When he talks about the way of man is froward and strange, a way to understand that phrase even is that the, the, the way of a, a wicked man is froward. Uh, the, the idea isn't just man. We'll, we'll cover that in a second. But the idea is, is a, a wicked man, an unbelieving man. And the way in which he suggests we go or the way that's naturally in man that leads to death. You know, there's a, a tricky nature of our of desire that there, there's a bit of a tension that's presented to us in the pages of Scripture, because we know that the heart is desperately wicked and deceptive. And that's Jeremiah 17, verse nine makes that exact case. However, we can also acknowledge the truth that the believer's heart is is being redeemed. The, the believer's heart being redeemed, and this is the work of the Spirit, which in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, we read that the Spirit works in us both to will and to do. That he's, God is changing our desires so that David can say in Psalm 42, that his heart longs for God. That the, the desires, the heart is, is being redeemed so that there, there is a, a, a certain tension. And I think about this, and, and even as I pray tonight for the unspokens, I was mindful of this. I don't always pray this, but I say, you know, grant the desire of your people's hearts. Which... Sometimes bothers me when I say it. Having prepared this message, I felt more comfortable saying that. But, you know, when our desire lines up with God's word, and you know, I trust that as we're walking with the Lord, as we're serving the Lord, as we're, we're praying to the Lord, that he's shaping and molding our desires and that our desires, that those unspoken requests, I, you know, I hope your unspoken request isn't to win the lottery. Because I will pray against that really hard if you tell me that's what actually what you want, right? I, I hope you're on, and I don't think you're, and I, by the way, just for the record, I don't think anybody's on smoking request is that. I think it has to do with, with uh, all sorts of issues. But, you know, Psalm 42, verse 1, as the heart 
panteth after the water brooks, or as the deer panteth after the water, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? That that David, this is a Psalm of David, right? No, it's not a Psalm of David. It's of the sons of Korah. Um, but it, it, they're, they're saying our, our hearts long for God. They're writing on the inspiration of the Spirit. The people of God sing Psalm 42. It's the psalm book of the Old Testament. And they're praying that our hearts should long for God. We should have righteous desires. Now, part of that, though, is always praying like Jesus. Not my will, but your will be done. Part of that is even what David um, you know, David praises the Lord in 2 Samuel 7 after the Lord tells him no. And 2 Samuel 7 starts off with David wanting to build the temple. And at first he gets permission from the prophet. Then the Lord says no. And we have what we call there the Davidic covenant, the promise about the son of David always reigning, fulfilled in Christ. And David, his desire to serve God was completely redirected. But he thanked the Lord for that. He, he prays for that. God sometimes redirects our lives. We may not get the exact desire, the exact thing we want to do. But our, our hearts should be longing for God. And we, we should always be looking to the wisdom and, and the goodness of God and the power of God. And saying, these things he's brought into my life for a reason to draw me close to the Lord. You know, this, this issue of the nature of desire, it, it's a really a big deal for Christians. So many Christians in our country today have listed as a, as a good desire something that's simply not in the Word of God. For a lot of them, they say, I want to be rich. I want to be wealthy by American standards. I want to have an easy life. Or I want whatever I want. A lot of people think about God as a, as a genie in the bottle. They wouldn't say that. But they just ask him for a list of things that they want. As opposed to having a, a relationship that is submitting to our God. We see this, this tension in, in some ways even here in Proverbs chapter uh, 21 verse 8. Sin is not an isolated event. One of the things I want us to see here is that it says the way of the man, way of man, way of a, a sinful man is froward and strange. The natural way of man is uh, froward. I love that word, that old King James word in the sense of it's not towards, not towards. But fro, it's, it's askew, it's away, it's drifting away. And as you think about our way, our way of life is a series of decisions. You know, when, when, when you think about the way of life, it's the things that you decide every day. It's the, the habits that you have. It's the things that you're doing. It's the pattern of your behavior. We often warn that one bad choice can ruin a life. We, we often are, are warned about that. And, and there is some truth to that, especially when we're talking about uh, sort of in this world and in this life. But we, we also can we also should warn that one good choice does not make a life. So we, and what I mean by that is, you know, it's kind of like a diet. I ate healthy for lunch. I ate nothing but spinach for lunch. But then I ate a whole lemon meringue pie for dinner. That's not a good diet, right? I made one good choice. I did one right thing. You know, a lot of Christians think the only good choice they need to make is if they show up for church on Sunday. I understand I'm preaching to the Wednesday night crowd. That's a bad. But anyways, you know, I came to church on this one time. Or I came to church twice or four times, and so I'm set. But that doesn't make a, a way of life. Now, those are good habits to have and, and very beneficial. But we have to understand that the imagery of a way of life is, is really a collection of everything we do. 
And in this verse, we're warned that because of unrepentant sin, call it that, the guilty's way is perverse or is froward. That's the idea of strange, is guilty. The way of man, the, the, the guilt of man, the guilty man has a perverse way. He has a froward way. He's going to miss the mark. They're motivated by selfishness. Even, even when they're doing good. And I had an amazing ethics professor that just proved every system of ethics was inherently selfish. If you remember, though, he couldn't disprove the ethic of the Bible. So he had to disprove that there was a God. And he had the weirdest. He said, well, God's defined by himself. Therefore, it's circular reasoning. Therefore, there is no God. Which is really strange. Uh, but, right, but every other system that's out there, you know, do, do the best good for the most men. That's arrogant. How do you know what the best good is? You don't. And so on and, and so forth. And, and that's what we, we see here. The, the way of, the, of, of man, the natural way of man is not going to lead to God, is not going to lead to righteousness, is not going to lead to life. The sign that man plants in the ground, no matter what it says, the options are, if it's coming from man, is going to lead to death. Fundamentally, that is the, the reality. However, the second half of the verse encourages us, and we can think about it this way, holiness impacts all of life. That as we're walking with the Lord, and as He is granted to us, as we'll see, repentance, it says, but as for the pure, His work is right. The work that the pure does. Now, we, we can say on the one hand, none of us are pure in and of ourselves. So what we're talking about here is the power of the gospel. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, Though our sins be red as scarlet, they shall be washed white as snow. Most of my children have never seen snow. They don't appreciate how brilliant white is. Fresh snow is, um, but it, I've, I've seen it a couple times in my life. Some of you have fled it. Um, snow is exciting to me, but I never had to shovel it every day to go to work. And so, uh, right, but it, it's this brilliant white. And this verse is reminding us that, yes, our sin is real. Yes, we've made bad choices. But the power of redemption in the gospel, that we can be redeemed, we can be saved, we can be washed white as snow. Remember that as, as, as because of that, that what we're reading about in the second half of verse 8 is a gift from God. This truth that what we do as we're walking with the Lord, as we're serving the Lord, is right, is pure, is holy, that we can actually do good deeds. Now, there's always perhaps a mixture, and you have that imagery of the refinement on the day of judgment. But as we serve the Lord, as we love the Lord our God with all our hearts, and as we love our neighbors as ourselves, we have the, the ability, out of joy, out of the truth that we are saved, we can actually serve other people and do good deeds. We can serve the Lord. What, a, what an amazing truth in some ways that it is to be part of the Lord's army, to be a, a soldier in the kingdom, to be an ambassador for Christ. What a joy that that should bring us. And you notice that it says work. That we can be distinctively a Christian and serving the Lord no matter where we go, no matter what we do, no matter what our profession is. But only through the cleansing power of the gospel. So here are, are the lessons that I want us to grab tonight is first off, remember 
the power of repentance, which is a gift of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive, must not quarrel, but be gentle unto all men, apt to te teach patience in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If paraventure, or excuse me, if God paraventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That the, the, the ministry of, in this case, the servant of the Lord, and he's talking to Timothy, he's talking about the ministry particularly of pastors and elders here. But we can say by extension the ministry of the church and all the people of God is to instruct those who oppose themselves, who are following the way of man unto death, instruct them in the truth of God's word. <coughs> Excuse me. And God may grant them, give to them, gift to them repentance, which will allow them to escape the snare of the devil by the power of the gospel. What a glorious truth this is. Remember also the role of the Word of God. When we think about desires, as I open the message with, those desires must be informed and even, if you will, written by the Word of God. Psalm 119, verse 11, talks about hiding God's Word in our hearts that we might not sin against Him. That hiding there is not the way that you hide something and then you can't find it. It's not the way I keep my toolbox. I know there's a screwdriver in there somewhere. I'm just not sure where in which of the 17 drawers that are there. That's a poorly organized toolbox. That's not what the imagery is. Instead, it's storing it so that you can find it and use it. And the Word of God as should be our something we're memorizing, something we're meditating, something we're reading for the purpose that we would use it even to inform our own desires that the Lord would, would grant us holy desires as we walk with him. May the Lord, through the power of the Spirit who uses the word of God in our lives, redeem our hearts that what we desire would be the good things of him, of serving him, the truth of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can study it tonight. And I just ask, Father, that you would help us to have desires that are aligned with your word, that truly our hearts would pant after your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember.